Resurrection Sunday and welcome to Charleston Baptist Church. We are so glad you are worshiping with us today. At this time, we ask that you direct your attention to the video screens for this week's highlighted announcements. This month's mission and prayer focus is the North American Mission Board and the Armstrong Easter Offering. This month, we ask that you pray for North American missionaries as they spread the gospel, plant churches, equip and disciple believers, and minister to communities in need. If you would like to learn more about North American missions, please visit the Next Steps page on the church website or church app. If you choose to give to this endeavor, please designate your offering to Annie Armstrong or NAMB. This coming week is spring break for many of our families. As a reminder, there will be no on-campus activities on Wednesday evening, April 3rd. We pray that you will enjoy this time with your loved ones. Are you ready to take the next step in your walk of faith? If so, we invite you to visit the Next Steps page on the church website or church app to learn more about our relationship with Jesus, baptism, joining our fellowship, connecting with a life group, volunteer opportunities, or signing up for an upcoming ministry opportunity. That's charlestonbaptist.org slash next steps. charlestonbaptist.org slash next steps. And once again, we welcome you to Charleston Baptist Church. If you are a first time guest, we would love to connect with you. We invite you to stop by the Next Steps desk in the main lobby after the service so that we can meet you and give you a welcome gift. And that is all of our highlighted announcements this week. Our worship service will begin shortly. We hope you have a blessed week and pray that we will see you again next Sunday, if not before. The morning sunrise. 
the women at the tomb, the shaking ground, the stone removed. This is Easter. The flash of lightning, the angel's testimony, the promise of Jesus, the empty grave. This is Easter. A day to hope against all odds. A day to worship our living God. A day to believe in the power of Jesus. A day to celebrate and a day to remember. The curse is broken. The promise is true. The tomb is empty. The king is alive. This is Easter. Well, good morning. Happy Easter to you all. It's good to be together this morning. Let's stand together as we join our hearts this morning to worship the Lord and Savior. We do serve a risen King this morning, and we're here to worship Him. So let's begin our time this morning singing together. Crown Him with many crowns.
thank the Lord for his goodness this morning as we join our hearts together. This morning we have an audience of one. And this morning we are going to celebrate that we serve a risen Savior. So at this time, let's sing together an old classic hymn together. Christ, the Lord is risen today. Christ the Lord is risen today. Question I have before I share a piece of information is 
you believe and know what you're just saying is true. Only you can decide that because it's a personal relationship. One little piece of information for everybody sitting in here, those watching online. This Wednesday, April 3rd, we will not have Wednesday night activities on this campus at Charleston Baptist Church. That does not mean you can't worship the Lord at home. It does not mean you can't spend time with your family or go out and worship somewhere. But this Wednesday night, April 3rd, we will not have activities on this campus. But worship the Lord in your way and in your time. Y'all got that? All right, thank you. And as we think about transitioning to a special time of giving, the offertory time, what a, that truly means. And you can see ways to give. That's between you and the Lord. But today, we celebrate the risen Lord and the gift of eternal life if you put your faith in him. The gift God gave, a free gift, but it cost God his son and it cost Jesus everything. That is giving. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we are gathered here today to worship you and to worship your son, King Jesus, because yes, he came out of that grave. Yes, he did, and he's alive and well, and he's in here today because your word tells us that. So, Father, remove all the distractions, remove everything, and let us worship you. And, Father, again, how great and loving and merciful and powerful you are the gift that has been given to everybody. And yes, as we're going to hear in just a few minutes, the resurrection, and if it's not true, we're wasting our time sitting in here today. But it is true. So let us worship and be grateful and thankful. And Father, let us count our blessings because they come from you. Father, let what's done in the rest of this service and as we leave here, and if you give us tomorrow for all believers we should be thankful every day that Jesus came out of that grave. And let us give you the honor and glory and praise. For we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Remember those walls that we call sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. Remember those giants we call death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came, and he died, and he rose. Those giants are dead now. This is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. He bore the cross. Beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim this is our God, King Jesus. Remember that fear that took our breath away, faith so weak that we could barely pray, but he heard every word, every whisper. Now those altars in the wilderness tell the story of his faithfulness. Never once did he fail, and he never will. This is our God, this is who he is, he loves us. This is our God, this is what he does, he saves us. Jesus, who for 
Praise the Lord. Happy Easter. Happy Resurrection Day to everyone. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Thank you for joining with us on campus. Thank you for joining with us also online as we worship the Lord together. So thankful for you being here and I'm thankful for the opportunity to share from God's word uh, this morning. And before we do, we'll do so opening up in prayer. Uh, Lord, as we come to this amazing and special time of just uh, studying your word, uh, Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would go before us and uh, be the power and, uh, Lord, the clarity that we need in our hearts and minds about the truth that is found in your word. And through the Holy Spirit, as those uh, truths uh, come to us, Lord, we receive those in faith, and those would be the very truths that we anchor or re-anchor our lives And Lord, you are so worthy of praise, and we're thankful for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you would, open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you're joining with us on campus and you do not have a copy of God's Word, I would encourage you to look underneath the seat in front of you or underneath the seat uh, that you're sitting in. There should be a blue Bible there, and I would encourage you to take that Bible, open it up to page 1063, 1063. And if you don't have a Bible, please take that Bible home with you. We'd love for you to take that Bible home with you because we believe God's Word is so important. Now, as we dive into our passage this morning, we are really um, picking up uh, towards the tail end of Paul's uh, letter to the church in Corinth. And so it's probably important for us to recognize and understand a little bit about what's happened already uh, through those first 14 chapters. Uh, Corinth uh, was the most important city in Greece uh, during this time. Uh, Corinth was a massive port city. Uh, It laid right there in between uh, two bodies of water And it was that uh, location of Corinth, that port city, uh, that was the the main hub for getting goods to Asia and Italy and and things like that. So this was a very important uh, part uh, of Greece. Because of its location, uh, there was a lot of cultural influence, right? So you can think about, uh, it's kind of similar to Charleston, to be honest with you. Uh, We we live on a port city. uh, And there's all kind of cultural influence. Uh, dynamics. And so when you think about all the cultural dynamics of life, that melting pot, there would be uh, diverse philosophies of life. And because of those philosophies of life, uh, there would be uh, different and different views of how to live. And unfortunately, for many of the Christians there in Corinth, uh, they began to attach themselves to a philosophy of life that I can have one foot in the world and one hand on Jesus, right? And because that's the philosophy that they begin to grab onto, uh, the Christians in the church in Corinth began to have uh, several issues. There was division in the church. Uh, there was disruption in worship. So great that Paul says, y- you do far worse coming together to worship God than you would if you just stayed away. In other words, the more you gather together as the body of Christ, the church, the representation of God's grace to the world, you're doing more harm to the name of Christ coming together. That's how bad things were getting. Uh, There was sexual sexual immorality. Uh, They were taking one another to court. Uh, So the Christians were struggling. And it was a deep struggle, again, because they're trying to keep one foot in the world and one hand uh, on Jesus. And yet, in the midst of all that, Paul writes this letter to the church in Corinth under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to remind them of how much God deeply loves them. And how is it that he communicates the love that God has for them? Through all that struggle, through all that sexual immorality, through all that divided allegiance between the world and the things of God, he reminds them of the beauty and the power that is found in the good news of the gospel. The good news is that Jesus has come into the world 
He lived a perfect life, died a gruesome death on the cross for our sins, your sin and my sin. And on third day, this Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday that we celebrate today, Jesus rose from the grave. And it's based on that that we pick up in chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. Now I would remind you, so Paul is writing this, now I remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand and by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to, to Cephas, then to the twelve then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then, all, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. What an amazing picture of the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul writes these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit so that the church in Corinth, and I believe the church today, would recognize that we cannot live with one foot in the world and one hand on Jesus. It doesn't work. And so he wants to re-anchor them. He wants to re-motivate them. He wants to put a fire in them to rightly live in a way that honors the Lord, glorifies the Lord, and, and builds up his church. And how does he do that? He does that through the message of the gospel. Look at those first three verses there. He says, now I would remind you, brothers. So he's talking to the church, the Christians there in the church in Corinth. And that word remind is important because he's not saying, I just want you to bring it to your memory. That word remind in the Greek talks about, I want to make known to you. I want to make known to you. And what is it that he wants to make known to them? He wants to make known the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand and by which you are being saved. So Paul says, hey, remember when I first came here? None of you believed in Jesus Christ. You were dead in your sin. But I had the opportunity to preach the gospel to you. And guess what? By grace through faith, you received the message of the gospel. You were given new life in Christ. And that was your new foundation of life. And then Paul adds, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. In other words, the gospel has implications in our life. He's saying, you, if you're really going to hold fast to the gospel, if you're going to cling on to the finished work of Jesus Christ, you can't live with one foot in the world and one hand on Jesus. He says, for I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received. Paul says the message of the gospel is something that I received. It was given to me. It's not my words, it's Jesus' words. And the very words that I received from Christ and put my faith in, those are the words that I gave to you, right? And I love the fact that, that Paul is wanting to focus on what's most important. Isn't that important? For us to be reminded that there are a lot of things that we can talk about. There are a lot of things that need to be talked about and need to be discussed, but Paul is reminding the church in Corinth, he's reminding us today that what's at the most important aspect of our conversations is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the core aspect that we need to be talking about. Paul says, keep the main thing, the main thing. So what is at the core? What is at the heart of the gospel? Why is that so important? Well, first, the gospel is Christ-centered. It is Christ-centered. In other words, the good news of the gospel declared to the world is not primarily about politics, right? It's not about preferences or programs or 401k plans or your educational route or your career path, all those different things. It impacts those things, absolutely. But what's most important about the gospel is a person, and his name is Jesus Christ. The gospel is Christ-centered. Why? Because Jesus died. He chose to die. Verse 3, the scripture says that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. At the heart of the gospel is the fact that Jesus didn't die because of our sins. 
Jesus died for our sins. There's a massive difference there. We are the ones who disobeyed. We are the ones who have rebelled against the Lord. We are the ones who, in pride and self-righteousness and self-arrogance, have shaken our fist at him and said, we are going to live life our own way. But God always had a plan. Praise be to God for that. He always had a plan to fix what was broken. And Jesus' death on the cross was according to God's plan. The scripture over and over and over again testifies to the promised one to come to die for the sins of the world. The prophet Isaiah, prophesying 700 years before the birth of Jesus, says in Isaiah 53, but he, speaking of Jesus, was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way. Is that not the truth? And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Through Jesus' death, he came to rescue the rebels. And who are the rebels? We're sitting right here. He came to cover our guilt and our shame through his sacrifice on the cross. Jesus' wounds on the cross were given so that we may be healed and that we would now have peace with our creator. It was always God's will and plan for Jesus to absorb the full wrath of God, the penalty for our sin, which is death. And Jesus stood in our place. Why? Because he is the perfect substitute. The Apostle Peter, writing about this in 1 Peter 3, verse 18, says this, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that, we, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the Spirit. Or you ever experienced those times in life where somebody comes up to you and says, I've, I've got good news and bad news. What do you want first? Well, typically you say what? I want the bad news first because it's going to make the good news so much better, right? What you don't want to happen is someone to come up to you and say, i got bad news and bad news, right? that's not a good that's no bueno right you don't want that and so typically you want the bad news first so that you can get to the good news and that's what the scripture does here the bad news is we all have sinned we've all have sinned right that's past tense something that's happened in the past but we continue to sin in the present tense right we continue to fall short of the glory of God in other words we miss the mark over and over again no matter how great our intentions are to live rightly guess what we can't do it and that's the, the important part. The mark, the standard is not what we determine. The standard is what God's word has determined. And that is perfect righteousness, perfect holiness, perfect perfection in any way. And the penalty for missing the mark, what we have done, is death. Separation, eternal separation from God. That is the bad news. But praise be to God, there is good news. Jesus died in our place. Jesus is our substitute. And on the cross, Jesus exchanged our sinfulness for his holiness. The separation that once existed now longer exists because of the finished work of Christ. The very righteousness that God requires from us is the very righteousness that God gives us through his son. Jesus removed the barrier of sin. Praise be to God for that. The gospel is Christ-centered because Jesus was buried. He was buried Verse 4 there, it says that he was buried. Jesus died on the cross. And what's the proof of that death? He was buried in a grave. He was buried in a tomb. And this is important. Because Pontius Pilate, one of the governors of Rome, gave the soldiers that nailed Jesus to the cross specific instructions to make sure that he was dead, right? In Matthew 27, verses 57 through 60, the scripture says, When it was evening, there came a rich man for Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. So he was a Christian. He was a follower of Christ. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And this is the phrase that's important. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Now that phrase there, that but when it says Pilate ordered it to be given to him, according to Mark 15, verse 44, this was only said after there was confirmation that Jesus had died on the cross. Remember, the spear thrust into his side, right? Jesus' death is not only a historical fact, but it's through the death of Christ that many receive spiritual blessings. The Apostle Paul writes about those blessings in Colossians 2. He says, and you who were dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, 
So that was the past, right? God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. In other words, on the cross, when Jesus died on the cross, he did what? He erased all of our sin, right? And on the cross, Jesus conquers all of our enemies, right? He secured the victory for us. This idea of the fact that we once stood condemned for our sins, guilty as charged, now we're not condemned. All our past sin, all our present sin, all our future sin have been forgiven in Christ. The legal term there is expunged. Jesus has expunged our record because of his blood. In other words, when the judge opens up your record, guess what he's going to see? Nothing but perfection. How many of y'all want that today? That's what happened on the cross. Jesus expunged our record through his death. He's in a buried tomb, but the gospel is Christ-centered, not just because he died and was buried, but because Jesus rose again. Jesus' resurrection is extremely important. Second part of verse 4, the scripture says that he was raised on the third day accordance with the scriptures. Now, if we're not careful, we look at that phrase there, he was raised, and we, we lose sight of the beauty there. The verb tense for that phrase is in the passive voice. That means someone had to do the action to you, right? Somebody rose Jesus from the grave. Who was it? It was his heavenly father. And why does that matter to us today? The very fact that the father rose his son from the grave, why is that significant for us today? It's significant because it tells us that Jesus was the approved, final, perfect sacrifice for our sin. The fact that Jesus rose from the grave is the Father's declaration that it is truly finished. Nothing else needs to be added and nothing else needs to be taken away from the gospel. He raised Jesus from the grave according to what? According to the scripture. Again, this is all part of God's plan. Jesus, right before his death, said in John 10 verse 18, he says, no one does what? No one takes it from me, talking about his life, but I lay it, I lay my life down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from who? My father. The preparation for the resurrection didn't happen overnight, right? When Jesus died on the cross and he's in that, that tomb, it's not like God just said, okay, I gotta make a plan now, right? The resurrection has always been plan A from the beginning. This was God's plan all along, and everything about our faith as followers of Christ hinges on what? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus' resurrection is so critical that without it, guess what? We have no gospel. We have no good news. We have no hope in this life and the life to come. This brings to mind the events that occurred on that Saturday. So in between Good Friday and Easter Sunday, there's a Saturday in there, right? What happened? Matthew 27, verses 62 through 66. The next day, that is after the day of preparation, so preparing for the Sabbath on Saturday, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how this imp that imposter, the imposter here is who? Jesus. That imposter, Jesus, said while he was still alive, so he's dead, right? After three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made what? Secure until the third day. Least his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. And the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have guard of soldiers. Go make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Now you read this passage and what jumps off the page is what? Pilate's words, you go and make it as secure as you can. And for every follower of Christ, we read that and we begin to chuckle. Why? Because no matter what they do to secure the tomb, nothing is going to stop Jesus from coming out of that grave. Think about the links that were taken to secure Jesus' tomb. That large uh, stone that was rolled in front of the tomb. This, this massive symbol of separation, right? Death and life. This immovable object that cannot be moved, right? 
And then on top of that, that's not enough. The scripture says that, that they were told to seal the tomb. That seal was a wax that they would put around the tomb, and it was a mark of uh, the authority of Rome. And the only way that that wax, that seal could be broken is if it came from the top down to the bottom, right? It had to be approved by those in charge, but not, that's not enough. Put the Roman guards in front of the tomb. Now, when you think about these Roman guards, please don't think about you know, some security guard at the mall, right? This is not mall cop Paul Blart, right? This is, I think about like Sylvester Stallone, Rambo, right? Arnold Schwarzenegger, Commando, or Russell Crowe, the gladiator. These guys were bred to, to fight, and they would lay down their lives to make sure that whatever the governor had said would be done, that's how important these guards were. But again, no matter how hard they tried, to secure that tomb, Jesus was coming out of the tomb. And here's the beauty. The stone was not rolled away so that Jesus could escape. The stone was rolled away so that we could see that he is alive. He is alive. And how do we know that the resurrection of Jesus actually happened? It goes public, right? It goes viral. I mean, before social media existed, I mean, likes and hits and all those things they're sharing this over and over again how is it shared through the eyewitnesses right verses five through seven uh, the scripture says in that he speaking of jesus appeared to cephas that is peter remember peter peter denied jesus three times before jesus died on the cross peter is one of jesus's followers and who's the first person that jesus goes to after he resurrects resurrected from the dead he goes where he goes to peter to restore peter and to right relationship and fellowship and ministry. And then it says, then to the 12. The 12 here is referring to the main apostles. And one of those main apostles was who? Thomas. Doubting Thomas. Remember when Jesus died, he would absolutely not believe about the resurrection of Christ. And unless he did what? Unless he could see and touch, right? And what did Jesus do? Jesus gave him an opportunity to touch the holes in his hands and his side. And what was the proclamation, the declaration that Thomas gave? Doubting Thomas gave it. My Lord, my God, right? And then the scripture says, then he, Jesus, appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. We don't know exactly this occurrence, but it probably appears to be on the hillside of Galilee when Jesus gives the great commission to all those who had gathered around uh, that hillside there. Uh, and the, that would have been roughly 25 years earlier. And so as 25 years have passed since that event, uh, some of them have passed away, right? None of them are still alive. Verse 7, then he, Jesus, appeared to James. James is more than likely the half-brother of Jesus. The one who grew up in the same home that Jesus grew up in. But James did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. He did not believe that he was the promised Savior. James, in fact, did, did as much as he could to stop the earthly ministry of Jesus until he saw Jesus rose from the grave. He gave his life to Jesus, surrendered to Jesus, and became one of the main leaders in the early church. And then the scripture says, then to all the apostles. Now, we know in Acts 1, between uh, Jesus' resurrection and his ascension to heaven, uh, for those 40 days, Jesus showed himself to many, uh, many apostles. Why? To, to tell them about the kingdom of God to come. And Paul says, you have all these public testimonies of the resurrected Jesus, but I have another testimony. My own personal testimony. Verse 8 he says, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Now that phrase, untimely born, is a very graphic phrase. It's a picture of an abor aborted fetus or a, a, a severe premature birth. And, and the scripture is communicating that there's no hope for life. And Paul says, that's exactly who I was before I met Jesus. I had no hope for life. Why? Verse 9, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I have persecuted the church of God. Paul says, when you think about the least likely person to come to faith in Christ, for grace, the grace of God to be given to them, I am the least. Why? Because in the midst of my journey to go on the Damascus road, to crucify and kill the very church that Jesus died for, guess what? Jesus revealed himself to me, and I became a follower of Jesus Christ. He was the chief of sinners, the hardest of hearts. 
this reminds us that the reach of God's grace is far more than we can give him credit for, right? It's, it's amazing. No one's past is so broken that your sins cannot be forgiven. How do we know? Paul is the evidence. And I would venture to say he's not the only evidence. I believe this room today is full of evidences of hard hearts that have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And the same be true of those who are worshiping with us online. Evidence after evidence after evidence. But this isn't the end of Paul's testimony. It's not the end of your testimony, right? The gospel is Christ-centered. The gospel is also what? It transforms lives. Verse 10. But by the grace of God, I, speaking of Paul, am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain, meaning it had a profound impact on my life. It changed me. It transformed me. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Every aspect of salvation, from forgiveness of sin to the release from God's wrath against our sin, to restoring the broken relationship that we once had, to growing in Christ and spending eternity in relationship with Jesus, it's all an act of what? God's amazing grace. Grace, undeserved, unmerited, unconditional love of God. We're so undeserving. And yet God sheds his grace on us. Grace when we are at our worst, dead in our sin, God chooses to give us his best, his one and only son, Jesus Christ. And the gospel reminds us that we're not the same people that we used to be, right? We're transformed from the inside out. Romans 6, 9 through 11, Paul says, we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died in, to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God, so you also, so he's talking to the church, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? It means because of Christ, we are no longer held captive to the power of sin any longer. Sin no longer has a hold on us because of the work of Christ. That means every member of our bodies, right, our, our minds, and our, our, our emotions, our hands and feet and legs and arms and eyes and ears, everything that once was dominated by the flesh and the sinfulness of our heart, guess what? Now can be dominated by Jesus Christ and who he is. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what? We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are his masterpiece. We are his work of art. That means every follower of Christ at some point recognize this, that you are extremely valuable to God. You are one of a kind. And because of that, you have tremendous purpose because of who you are in Christ, no matter what the world tells you, right? And that's what the world wants to tell you. That's why the word is so important. God sees me as a precious son or daughter, and I have infinite value and unmatched purpose. Why? Because I am a new creation in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. I love this verse. Who can be made new? Who can be made new? What does the scripture say? Anyone, right? Anyone and everyone. He offers amazing grace to them, but it must be received, right? It must be received in faith. And once you receive that grace in faith, guess what? You are a new creation because of Jesus. When God looks at you, God doesn't see you as a sinner just trying to do the best you can. He sees you like he sees his one and only son, perfect in every way. I mean, Dad, that is your position in Christ today. Do you believe that? Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, reminds us of that truth. That when my, when my heavenly father looks at me, he doesn't see me as someone who's just trying to do the best I can. He sees me like his son, perfect in every way, every way. That, that is the truth that we need to hear because it's out of that position that we can begin to practice and live out our faith in Christ. And how is that to be done? Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. 
And the life I now live in the flesh on this earth, I live how? I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you hear the power here? I live by faith in Jesus. He has given me his spirit. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave now lives in me. And before I even talk about behaviors and all those different things, the things of how I live, he anchors us where? He anchors us back to the love that he has for us. And it's through that love, by grace through faith, that we begin to live. Jesus reminds us that Satan no longer has a hold on us, right? We live by faith, not in what I can do, but what Jesus has already done for me. So the gospel not only transforms lives, lastly, the gospel requires a response. It requires a response. Verse 11, whether then it was I or they, so we preach and what? And so you believed. There's no greater message to share. There's no greater message to receive than the message of God's amazing grace given to us in Christ through the gospel. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 1, 16 and 17, for I am not ashamed, I am not a losing confidence of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, and it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The gospel is the power of God for what? For salvation, for anyone, for all humanity, right? It's the undeserved second chance that we need time and time and time again. That's the amazing grace, the gift that God provides. And it changes our lives, right? It changes our lives. It's available to all, but only gifted to those who receive it. Paul says in Romans 10, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, made right, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved, begins to live rightly. So putting your faith in Christ isn't just about the mind, right? It's not just knowing a bunch of facts. Is it important to understand facts about Jesus, truths about Jesus? Absolutely. But this idea of believing is about relationship, that you're surrendering your life to him. Why? Because he is the king. He's King Jesus for a reason, right? So it's about surrendering your life to him. Jesus' death on the cross reminds us that our sins have been dealt with. Jesus' burial in the tomb reminds us that our sins have been removed forever. Jesus, or the Lord will never bring up your sins to you again. Isn't that awesome? Why? Because he buried them in the grave, right? He removed those sins from us. And the resurrection from the grave reminds us that our future is secure. Our future is secure. And in that future, man, we have amazing power. So as the worship team leads us in our time of response, I'll close with this. Again, the idea the gospel requires a response. Apart from Christ, meaning you do not have a relationship with Jesus, you have not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You die in your sin. You die to God's eternal wrath. You die from the, from the comforting presence of the Lord. You die enslaved to the powers of this world, Satan, and to yourself forever. Separation. But with Christ, a relationship with Christ, receiving Christ as your Savior, your sins are forgiven. God's wrath is forever satisfied. You will never be abandoned. You are given new life in him, and you will always have that relationship. Meaning there's always a seat at his table. Praise God. Praise God. Why? Because Jesus died, Jesus was buried, and Jesus rose from the grave. That is the message of the gospel. And so I would encourage you, respond to him today. Maybe you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe this is the first time you're hearing about the gospel, but something is beginning to happen and you know you need a Savior. Your sin has separated you from your Creator and you've tried everything to fill that gap. You've went through performance and possessions and power, and academics and career and hobby after hobby and nothing satisfies you. Guess why? Jesus will not let you be satisfied unless he is the one that satisfies you. Will you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today? 
And maybe you already received Christ as your Savior, but maybe you're like the church in Corinth. You're trying to live with one foot in the world and one hand on Jesus, and you realize it's not working. There's a reason why. Will you respond to Jesus today in faith? Will you come to your Savior and say, Lord, I confess my sin, I repent of my sin, and Lord, today I want to renew trust in the finished work of Christ. He purchased your freedom in full. Will you choose to live in that freedom today? Whatever your decision is, the altar will be open for you to respond. You can praise the Lord here. You can pray to the Lord here. I'll be up front. I'd love to pray with you. But whatever your decision is, let us sing to the Lord. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus fled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior that cursed tree His body bound and drenched in tears They laid him down in Joseph's tomb The entrance sealed by Messiah still and all alone. Oh, church. Oh, praise the name of the 
Praise the Lord. Thank you again for being here on this Easter Sunday, this Resurrection Sunday, as we worship the Lord both on campus and online. We'd love to connect with you. We'd love to help you take your next step in your walk with the Lord. So if you have any questions about what it means to, to be a, 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 have a relationship with Jesus, or maybe there's places of struggles that you're walking through, or maybe you're interested more about Charleston Baptist Church or how to get engaged in more ministries or places of service, uh, we'd love to connect with you if we can pray for you or uh, lift up a praise on, on your behalf because of what God is doing in and through your life. We'd love to just be a part of that. So we, if you're on campus, we have a next step area to your left in our main gathering area. If you're joining with us online, we do have an online connection card. Please fill that out and send that in, and we'll be more than happy to get back to you. And uh, we just want to do everything we can to help grow healthy disciples uh, here at Charleston Baptist Church. But God is worthy of praise. Praise be to God. I pray that just think about the letter that the Paul was given by the Holy Spirit to the church in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 15, after all that baggage of disunity, sexual immorality, all the things that were going on in the church, Paul gives them the gospel. And I can promise you, almost promise you, that that message in 1 Corinthians 15 wasn't given on Easter Sunday. Why? Why does that matter? We need the gospel every single day. Let the gospel of Jesus Christ be your fuel every single day. You have new life in Christ. You have new power in Christ. Your past forgiven, your present empowered, and your future secured. I can't think of a better life than that. All because of the glory of God by grace through faith. So I would encourage you to continue to walk in your relationship with the Lord. I'm going to pray for us, and then right after I pray... Uh, before we dismiss, uh, Pastor Sean and our worship team are going to lead us in our final song. Lord, as we uh, close uh, in just a moment our services this morning, Lord, we are reminded that we are going to leave this sanctuary. We're going to enter into the world. And Lord, I pray that we have been reminded, as you have reminded us through your word today, that the, the Christian life isn't about having a foot in the world and a hand on Jesus. The Christian life, to truly be enjoyed and experienced, is about wrapping everything that we are around the finished work of Jesus Christ. And I pray this morning we are reminded of that precious gift that you've given to us. And for those who have never received Christ as their Savior, I pray today would be the, maybe the first time that they've ever heard anything about good news. And I know we need good news. And so I pray that through the Spirit's working, Lord, they will receive you as their Lord and Savior. And we will celebrate along with them. Lord, thank you again for this time. To God be the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
together, let's sing it. He's alive. Thank you for being here this morning. We hope you have a wonderful Easter. Have a great day.